Alrighty. Let's see if we can review this from White's perspective. So review this game. Okay. Alrighty, already. Here we go. Well, I'm seeking uh, private lesson students. Or public lessons. I guess they can be public if you want them public. I'm just uh, seeking paying students to kind of get more students because I'm trying to convert my jobs over to Teach and Go. You can always ask the chat to sponsor you. I also, <laughs> like, if someone sponsors, I've had people sponsor other people for lessons. So if someone sponsors you for lessons, uh, there's always that. But, all right. So we are going to uh, look at this game. We're going to be looking from White's perspective. And we're going to be asking ourselves, <laughs> yeah, even if you're my favorite person on the internet. Because uh, I have to I have to eat. <laughs> I could have a, I could have you as my favorite person, but if, if you don't feed me, then I'll die. Uh, anyway, so we're going to be learning how to review uh, our games, and when like uh, when we uh, whenever we play a rated game, we should always be reviewing it. But we want to learn how to review it. Uh, I'll give you a link to the lesson page that way you can just look over it. There you go. Seansgogroup.com. Uh, so, the first thing you need to realize when you play is this is a points game. You're going to have to count in your reviews. Now, you don't have to count perfectly, uh, especially at this level, you don't have to count perfectly. You just need to have an idea of what's happening and then be looking at the exchange rate. So, it's not just about how much did I get in total. But it's about how much did I get in an exchange. So I've lectured a lot about this recently, and it's about the exchanging of points. Uh, and that's the first big thing you want to look at. And then the second big thing is efficiency. And that is how many moves did you spend to get those points? Uh, and then how many moves did your opponent spend to get those points? And you want to try to be more efficient than your opponent. So let's let's look at that and just look at those two things. And that way we can we should be able to improve our games just with those two things. All right, so here we have uh, two open sides, left side and right side. So if you're following the classy approach, yep. Then you're playing open corners, open sides. Uh, I am offering a deal this week for lessons, by the way, guys. Uh, and that is for every bundle you buy this week, uh, the adult bundle, uh, then you get one extra lesson for free, and that's to uh, raise funds for Go Congress. Because if I can raise enough and get enough students, then I'm gonna go live stream at uh, Go Congress. Uh, I'm actually talking to family members and trying to get over there if I can. But uh, any, as, if I get students, then it'll be all the more helpful and all the, the easier it'll be to get over there. So if you guys want lessons for this week only, or the go, week of Go Congress, uh, lessons are buy a bundle, get one free. All right, so Black did not play the most open side. Uh, White did play the most open side. Uh, all right, so normally, uh, basics tells us that we have three moves on an open side. One is a five space extension, or so an extension, a corner enclosure, which is usually one space down, uh, or an approach, which is like here or here, one space or two spaces approach. So this one's a little bit strange. So it's not shapes, but uh, it is on the right side of the board. Okay, we play three, three. All right. And now our opponent's sealed in. So let's see, what's the most open side now? I think it's the top side, the top side or the left side. But this thickness usually wants to extend, so I would say that, that uh, K16 is quite big. All right, so he pushes the corner first. All right, he does an incente. Uh, don't try to kill if you can't. All right, so now he goes here, so it's not the most open side anymore. Because if you count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So this one's definitely bigger. But okay, so now we finished a variation, right? So now white is officially Tanuki. So we need to determine if this is good for white or good for black. And to do that, we need to count the exchanges. So first off, globally, uh, you want to always understand globally what's happened. White has one Shamari. Shamari is worth about 10. Black has one Shamari, 10. All right, black has 
four points here and you can just draw a little box you can connect the stones then draw a line straight down so it's four points uh so it's 10 10 so black's up by four points but now we need to look at this whole corner right so now let's judge that corner uh okay so we'll go ahead and delete that so we counted the points very easily you want to always count the exact points and then say there's influence uh so in this case black has one two three because you got two for the dead stone one two three four black has four points and white has influence and normally if the influence is uncontested you could if you need uh if you need a, a good guiding step to just say there's value for it if it's uncontested like it has influence on the sides or whatever then you could count about two points per influence so there is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So you can say there's about 20 points here. Uh, and I would say at, this wall should at least get 15. Like, at worst, it should get 15. That's from experience. But I would say you could potentially get 20 points of this wall. So this wall, in theory, is worth 20 points. And black got four points. And we, could, we could also count how many stones it took. So black had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 stones for 4 points. White has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 stones for 20 points. So I think white is much more efficient here and much more valuable in this corner. Now we go back and compare it to the whole board. So black was up by 4. So here, black has four, white has 20, so white, uh, so you subtract uh, four, 16 points greater for white in this corner. Then we compare it to the whole board, so you, su you subtract the four points here, because black was up by four, so you subtract another four points, and white is winning by 12. But don't forget Comey, because in this game, he does have Comey, so if you have Comey, you need to calculate that. So it's 12 plus six, so white is winning by about 18 and a half points right now. So it seems like quite a lot, even though it's only been about it's only been 27 moves. White is up by almost 20 points. And yes, white also is sente. And if we follow the classy approach, we find the open side, and we could say that white's up by uh, 23 because that's 20 points of influence, and this is one, two, three points. Because a fourth line stone should get at least three points under it, probably. Uh, so you could say white is up by like 21 points now. So approximately 20 points because, again, we are amateurs. Well, not again, but uh, we are amateurs, so we cannot count perfectly. But we can have a good estimate, a good accurate estimate, uh, um, an educated estimate or whatever that is. And we could say that white is approximately ahead by 20 points already. So on this board, I really like white. Now, it's not game over because at this level, 20 points is not game over. Uh, at a higher level, it would be very, very difficult, but it's still not game over because black can easily make another 10 points here. Potentially 10 points here. So it's not over, but we do have to continue playing the game, and it could potentially proceed something like this, making exchanges. But white is, white is winning. All right, so now we know that black, is prob black probably made a mistake in that corner, at least. Now, you could also argue that N3 is a mistake for direction-wise, but that's a basics mistake. Uh, so there's two mistakes you want to look out for in your games. One is a basic mistake. Uh, so you can actually have the classy uh, approach sheet next to you and say, did I follow the basics? Okay. The second is an efficiency mistake. And this corner is definitely an efficiency mistake. Too many moves for too little points. So black made a mistake in this corner. So when, if you can see this result, then you can see, okay, a mistake has been made in this corner. Uh, so now let's figure out where the mistake was. Uh, and probably it was losing Sente, because right here it's fine. Uh, it's about two, four, six points. Two, four, six, eight. Um, 10, 12, 14, 15 points. About 15 points for six points, so about nine points. And then I just go to the next big move. So that's clearly better. Now, why is it nine points ahead for white? That's probably because of N3. But it's not as bad as 20, right? I just immediately made a 10-point improvement on my game 
just by seeing that and changing the move. So immediately I've uh, made a 10 point better exchange. So if you count and all the exchanges are bad for you, take the one that's least bad for you. And that will really help you out. Uh, and it doesn't, just because uh, you're losing, doesn't mean your move in this area is bad. It just means globally you have less points than your opponent. So globally your mistakes probably have added up. But if you're trying, if you're looking at just this turn, or if you're looking at uh, just this corner and like this turn, then you want to judge it as is. Every single turn you want to judge it as is. Once you're alive, you want to take Sente if you can, uh, if it's valuable, and you want to do something with it. And so we want to make the most valuable move possible in order to decrease that deficit that we have. So currently, after like if we count it like this, I would say whites up by potentially nine points. Uh, I, I think the mistake um, is this move. This move only gains four points for one move. Uh, this, something like this is much more valuable. So this might be a little advanced for this level, but that's again an efficiency mistake. But uh, that's because this one's a direction mistake and an efficiency mistake. So this one's actually two mistakes. Uh, and that's why white, uh, white is potentially ahead, but nine points. You could potentially do that. Uh, because this one at minimum is worth five and that's worth four. So at worst, white's up by one uh, on the board and then Comey. So it's like seven and a half on the board. So don't forget white has Comey. Uh, so here, white is already up by seven. But when you compare it here, white's up by nine. But black has Sente, so black could go here and potentially stop white's side of the board. Uh, it should also be noted that on your opponent's side of the board, they're going to have a point or two better than you global uh, on that half of the board. And that is because they control that side of the board. If the, you're trying to get more than your opponent on your opponent's side of the board or where your opponent has control, then you're probably overplaying a little bit or your opponent makes a made a mistake. So you need to realize that on your opponent's side of the board, they're going to have a slight advantage. And on your side of the board, you're going to have a slight advantage. Uh, and it evens out globally. So at all times, you need to take the global comparison of points and uh, to have a good judgment of what's happening on the whole board. So here, I would say white's up by about nine, which so maybe a two-point deficit, but this is not needed because you're already alive, so this move is much bigger because this is the biggest move. So you can catch up one point at a time by playing the biggest move and letting your opponent play a slightly slow move and gaining a one-point advantage, and then play the next biggest move, et cetera, et cetera. So right now, there's nothing to attack, so it's not like I can gain back the two points. So the best strategy is just to prevent my opponent from getting a move that's bigger than my move. So I play the biggest move on the board this turn. One could also argue that uh, maybe mine's bigger than my opponent's. Like, maybe I can do that. Or maybe I'll just make mine bigger than my opponent's in order to gain the two points back. And that's another potential strategy. That's a different style. Right, So this one could say, I'm going to prevent my opponent's side, and this one says I'm going to increase my own side. So it just depends on what you want to do. So uh, my style is, if mine and my opponent's territory is approximately equal, I'll build mine, mine first. And that's my style. But you have to realize that both sides are approximately equal, otherwise the, uh, you're not going to play the right one, or you might play on the wrong side. For example, if I play on this side, then it doesn't matter how, which one's bigger, you didn't play either of them. So in this case, it actually doesn't matter which one's bigger as long as you're playing a big move. That's what I'm trying to get across here. So you could argue all day which one's bigger, um, but that's not the point. The point is, in the game, Black played this move when Black was already alive and lost Sente. And that's why we can say that Black made a mistake somewhere in this corner, because we judged it from um, here. We saw that Black made a mistake because this is clearly too good for white. And so when we go back, we look at this variation in the corner and say, where could we have done better? And we we can say that, oh, we should have got Sente sooner and played the next big move, and it had been uh, about 11 points better. Approximately 10 points better if we had gained Sente in this corner. All right, so now we play, now we continue to play. Uh, so we want, we can see that uh, white played on the right. I think the top side and the left side's bigger, but white played the right. Black pincer. Mm -hmm. And now I play here. But if we compare that to 
just doing this, compare that to here, you can see that this board is clearly more valuable than white than the other one. So probably black made a bad exchange in this corner, and that is he didn't save his weaker. So peep, uh, and then jump back. White is weak, even if white plays a big move, attacking is very valuable. Attacking is very valuable. So I would say probably white played too close to thickness uh, and black didn't attack it properly. So here we can talk more about attack and defense. So what do the attack and defense steps tell us? Attack and defense steps tell us to surround. So to surround, what about this one? Well, then white can break out and get us part. Okay, so we have some weakness. So we need to surround while watching our weakness. Uh, this peep just seems sente, so it's just a good exchange. But even if you don't see the peep, it's fine. Uh, just surround white while, while defending yourself. Okay, I'll do this, and then this, and then this, and then this. Uh, I think this is good for me. So even if white starts attaching or something like that, just some generic exchange, right? Let's just give white the benefit of the doubt. Um, I'm alive. Mm. No, let's do this. This is because there's some odd gene here. Live. Defend myself. We play a very. Uh, we are just playing some shape right now to get an idea, an example, because in the game it's never going to go exactly how we predict. Almost like 100, nearly always, uh, and will not go exactly how we predict. So we use shape to get a rough estimate. And when we review, when we're reviewing the game, we can actually play out these moves and try to get some good shape to have a rough estimate of what could happen. Uh, now during. When we review, we want to do this, and we want to try to do it in our head first, see it as far as we can, play it out to double check ourselves, and then go back and reread it again to check for weaknesses. Uh, and this will help you read deeper and deeper and deeper during the game by practicing it in your reviews. Uh, but in your reviews, you can also play it out to get you better judgment. So here we just defend ourselves, and then we reevaluate the board. All right, so up here, it's about uh, 20, so four, so, so 16 for white, 10 and 10. Uh, all right, so black has 6, 8, 10, 12, uh, 14, 16, 18. So black's up by 2, maybe, but white also has uh, maybe 2 or 4 points here of influence. I would say 6 or 8, but since this stone's contesting it, I'm going to lower it a little bit. This is just my personal judgment, yeah, but uh, you can value it however you need to. But white has a couple points here, probably, for eyes. Uh, and so here we can say black has significantly caught up. So where did white make a mistake? Because white was clearly winning, but now it looks like it's almost even. Uh, and that is because black has made all these moves on the outside for free. So when black plays all these moves, let's look at the exchange rate. Just play some shape. Look at the exchange rate. Black gets the A territory uh, he had the A territory, so, oh, sorry, I, uh, I counted B right here. I shouldn't have counted that. So it's 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. So black still, uh, white still up by about 4 to 6, in theory. Um, anyway, so black is catching up. And that is because black gets A and black got B. White only got C, which is clearly smaller than A and B. So the exchange rate in this corner is very, very good for black, or it's uh, it's the exchange rate is very much in black's favor. Uh, so here, we can see that this attack, getting attacked right here, is really good for black. So probably we shouldn't have got attacked so easily here, because if we get attacked this easily, then probably our original move is a mistake. So we want to go back. Okay, don't get attacked. Well, we could easily prevent that by simply going for a two-space approach instead, uh, and that might be better. Uh, what do I mean by play some shape? Uh, one second, let me finish this thought and I'll explain that. Uh, so, or we could play the big move here or here. And that may be much more valuable than just getting attacked in the bottom right. So we can say that in the bottom right, getting attacked was likely a mistake because the exchange rate was in black's favor a little more than we would like. So we can just simply play a big move and it would be much more effective. And we know that, and the reason we can know that is because we proved it with counting and judgment and the judgment is exchange of points and uh, counting both sides and then the comparison of points so with the comparison of points 
uh, and the exchange rate, we can value that we can uh, prove and value that there's some mistake in the bottom right corner, and theoretically, it was likely that attack. So theoretically, we can play a better move, and that better move probably is a big move. Okay, so what do I mean by playing some shape? What I mean by that is, uh, if you review pro games, you're likely to pick up some shape, and when you review uh, Joseki's and play lots of games, you pick up shape over time. So in this case, a one space low pincer is a shape when you have high on one side, low on the other, right? The most basic of basic defenses is to make a base, but we can't. So the next basic is to jump, to run away. Okay, so we jumped, run away. Okay, so we wanna surround, because the classic approach tells us to defend ourselves while surrounding is a great counterattack as well as a defense. Okay, so the first instinct is to make a base, but since we can counterattack, we want to do that. In the counterattack, we want to surround, and we want to defend ourselves. This jump defends ourselves and surrounds. Okay, and then we just continue jumping and jumping and jumping and jumping, and one-point jumps are very basic shapes. Uh, from here, an attachment here is also another common shape. It's kind of like a, a nose. I forget which nose. It's like horse or something. Um, and then uh, when you attach, you hane. When they hane, you nobi. Uh, I have a cut, so I fix my cut by, with a peep. And then I fix my base by defending the corner. Uh, these are all, maybe I'm going through it a little too fast. Uh, dog's face. Maybe I'm going through it a little too fast, which I apologize for, but uh, these are all very basic shapes. Uh, so you may not know the basic shapes, which is fine. That's not the point, actually, uh, of this lecture. The point isn't to play the best basic shapes. The point is to play some basic shapes that you know to kind of have an idea of how this situation is going to play out. And you can improve your basic shape knowledge by reviewing pro games. So my basic shape is not perfect. My prediction rate is definitely not perfect. But I have a certain level of basic shape and basic expectation of what's going to happen from experience and study. So I've played lots of games, I've played thousands of games, and I've reviewed hundreds if not thousands of pro games. Uh, and that's how I have some basic shapes. So you can also do that, uh, and you should also, at any level, have some general idea, at least a small inkling of an idea of what's gonna happen. Uh, and even if it's not perfect, just do your best. It's not about playing it out perfectly, it's about playing a generic sequence and uh, playing something that you would expect to happen, and then see what the value is after that generic sequence happens. Now, this will help you determine locally if an idea is good or not, but it will not prove, it will not find all the best moves. This will help you as a Q player, but uh, once you get to like five down plus, it gets a little bit more complicated, but that's not, um, right. that's not uh, the idea for this right now. This is a very basic idea to help you review your games. Now, what the difference is, uh, these are very good for getting an idea to count, to judge, and improve our judgment. But the thing I'm saying that's not perfect is the reading. And that is because what if White plays like right here? What if Lee Sado came over and took over and played some fancy Tsuji, completely changed the result? Well, obviously, that's going to be better than any generic seats we can come up with. But we have to start somewhere. So I'm not saying this is perfect, this is gonna work every single time. I'm saying this should give you some steps to work with to at least have a general idea of what you're supposed to do. So this will help you determine if there is likely a mistake in that corner or not, uh, or in an area or not, and then you can slowly uh, try to figure out where the mistake was, and then try to evaluate what you could have done better. And you can use basics to try and solve that up until like five dots. Like, even I still uh, struggle with solving where all the mistakes were, but usually uh, I have to just do what I can, and I just use basics to try and solve it until a professional player comes along and shows me this amazing sequence that I could have done to completely change everything, and then, yeah, of course, if you can read that, then that's much better. But you have to start somewhere, and this is what I'm trying to say for this lecture, this is what I'm trying to argue, is that you want to start by reviewing your games and counting the exchange rates, and then looking at the efficiency. So that's how we've found, uh, we've found probably three pretty, uh, pretty three probably semi-significant mistakes in this game. Uh, and this is just in the first 30 moves, right? So in the first 30 moves, we found three probably uh, big mistakes. And that's because we're counting and using exchange rates to figure it out. 
And that's what I want you to be able to do in your games is use these exchange rates to find your mistakes or find places you could have done better. So here, this is probably a fourth mistake because you're not following the basics and uh, your opponent is uh, getting more than you. Uh, so this is, a, this is a classy approach basic mistake and that is defend your weak groups first. It's much easier. And you can defend it by surrounding. So even if you had done this, it is more valuable than this. But you can increase this value by counterattacking and defending while counterattacking. And already, you've increased its value. And then you may be able to increase it even more by continuing to jump. And that comes with experience, knowledge, know-how. But you won't start improving until you start pushing yourself to improve. You won't start improving until you review your games and critically analyze them like this. All right, so black plays a big move. White plays here. Uh, you normally want to bring it down to the fourth line. Uh, it just makes it easier and it's uh, less aji. Uh, but, okay, you're defending your weak group, which is fine. This is uh, not the biggest area because the top side's bigger than this. This is also not the biggest area. This is the center. Center and gote is what? Does anyone know what the center and gote is? Give you about 10 seconds to think about it. It's just one word. Center and gote. Center and gote. I want you to remember this expression. Center and gote. Center and gote is right, not big. It's very, very small. It's bad. Center and gote is bad. Center and gote is very, very small. It's way too easy to reduce. It's not efficient, and it's hardly any points. So, center and gote, that's an expression you should remember, and it, you should remember that center and gote is bad. It's not big, it's not efficient, it's very small. So I want you guys to remember that one. Uh, open corners, open sides, biggest area. So biggest area, if you look at the line of the influence, uh, so for example, say I wanted to invade and I didn't want to get attacked, so I didn't like the invasion. So okay, so I'll try to reduce. This is not center and gote. This is center and sente because I'm threatening to reduce while developing the center. Then I can go back and play the big moves, biggest move, and that's fine. Right, so center and gote is bad, but center and sente is not always bad. So remember that if you're in the center, you want to be sente or be doing something or threatening something. There's only one exception, and that is when you're, when you seal something that's just ginormous, like huge. Like, why did they not stop it? Uh, so like probably like 50 or 60 points you surround it, seal it with one move or two moves no, probably just one move usually just seal it in one move, you get like 50 points that's fine but 98% of the time center and gote is bad uh, or not efficient or not good so just remember that uh, alright, so these, so these moves so if we look right here uh, we can actually say black has uh, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 24, 16, 30. 30 points uh, plus 4, so about 35. I'm going to give or take 35. Uh, plus this side. This side is probably going to be about 15 to 20 points. Right? And black says, I'm going to make it very large. So um, 35 plus 15 to 20 is about 55 points. That's a lot of points. 60 points is a good number to be at. Uh, white has 10, um, 10, 20, uh, 30, 40, about 50 points, 55, 56 and a half, so approximately 50 points. So white is okay. It's not actually bad for white. White's still doing okay. So all white has to do is just reduce this area and get to the top side, and white's probably ahead, okay? So we counted, we judged that, probably pretty good. Uh, so for that matter, this black move probably actually should be on top to start preventing stuff because white is getting more than black. When your opponent gets more than you, you should prevent it. Uh, so this Hani is fine because you don't want him to just seal it. But this push is one thing I want you guys to remember. Uh, this push is usually bad. Not always. This, I, I would say it's bad probably half the time, give or take, but that's just a made-up statistic, so don't quote me on that. Uh, but normally, you should have a hint in your head. Pushing from behind. This is an expression you can remember. 
Pushing from behind is usually good for your opponent. Yes, don't push from behind. Pushing from behind is usually good for your opponent. You only push from behind when you're trying to stop your opponent from pushing you in Sente or you're trying to fix your own shape. So here he's trying to stop Black from pushing him in Sente. But at the same time, every push from behind is forcing Black to build on the sixth line. Seventh line, sorry. Seventh line. Uh, and you're winning. Just go win. And if he does this, okay, then just go reduce. Here's the line of the Moyo, just reduce it. Or you can play a diagonal. Uh, what about what if I just jump here? What if I just made all of that? Uh, anyway, so reduce and sente, then build your own. That's usually the best way to deal with uh, a moyo because the invasion might be a little too late. So just reduce and sente and develop your own. Uh, you could even potentially threaten a shoulder hit or try to get shaped to make a shoulder hit. Or potentially just do that. Watch the cuts. Maybe this one's not good. So anyway, I would read here and try to find a good way to do it. But the idea is reduce and sente to develop your own center. Uh, so this move could be very large. Now, if you thought, like maybe you judge that his moyo is much bigger than your top side. So if you thought that uh, the bottom left is much bigger than the top middle, okay, that's fine. Maybe your judgment's not perfect. Maybe you uh, thought that. Then what should you do? Should you push from behind? No, the answer is you should reduce. It's still reduce. Uh, you just reduce one step sooner because you think theirs is bigger. And if they go out, then you simply jump and just destroy their center. Don't forget your goals. So don't forget the goals of the classy approach, the goals of your move. You evaluate if your judgment's correct by counting the exchange rates, but you still need to remember the basics and the goals on how to deal with a position. So if you say the exchange rate of the top for the bottom is good for black, then what do you do when your opponent's area is bigger than yours? You s destroy both, okay? So you need to destroy the, uh, the bottom left. So how do you destroy it? Well, the only two, the two common tactics is an invasion or reduction. Invasion, if you read it, looks difficult. A reduction, if you read it, looks much easier. So let's reduce. Uh, and then we just do that. And then later when you get stronger, like stronger than 5Q, you'll actually compare both. So you'll try to invade and try to live. If you can live, like, I don't know, Sabaki or something, you'll count, uh, but maybe they just force you to live, uh, and then they play the top side. You read a few moves, you count, and then you compare that to reduce, uh, and then count, uh, reduce, invade, then count, or reduce, they block, and then count, and then you go up here. And after you get stronger than 5Q, that's what you're supposed to do, is you're supposed to read each of those. You're supposed to have multiple options, read each of them, count each of them, and then play the biggest, most valuable one. Uh, hey, welcome to the Insane World of Go, Zef Zefuro? Zefuro? Uh, but anyway, that's you're supposed to find the possible basic moves, Read each one with for a few moves, count it, and see what the best and see what the most valuable exchange rate is, and then play the one with the best exchange rate. But supposed to is a very strong expression, and many many players don't. Uh, I I don't want to say I don't do it, but I don't do it as much as I should. So I am also kind of guilty of this. Uh, so in your games. If you want to uh, improve your game, if you're a single digit Q uh, and you want to improve your game, try doing that counting thing that I just mentioned. It could drastically improve your efficiency. Uh, and if you're a double digit Q and you want to improve your game, give yourself multiple options before playing every single turn. Uh, and so if you want to improve your game, just look at the exchange rates of every variation. And then also look at the efficiency, basically how many moves did it take to accomplish that variation, and try to just improve those two things when you review your games. When you play a game, you should always be reviewing. When you review, look at those two things, and that should really help you find better strategies and better moves in general, and should significantly increase your game, probably by like one or two ranks, if you can start doing it much more often. Yes, counting is very hard, 
but it's also very important. The game is kind of based on the exchange of points, so if you're not keeping track of the points, then you're probably not understanding what's happening on the board correctly. Uh, so I would say if you can do this little counting exchange thing every single turn, you're done. Like if you were, if you have the points in your head and you're seeing what points are going to happen like three or four moves in advance, you're probably a Don. So if you want to improve, just practice doing it once every 10 moves. Then once every five moves. Then once every three moves. Then once every single turn. And then eventually you'll realize you always know the score. You always know the score of the game. And from there, you can add to it and say, I'm going to count after each variation I read. And you should be reading probably at least three to five variations every single turn uh, or almost every single turn and then evaluating those variations in your head and coming up with the most efficient and most valuable plan but that's a lot easier said than done but these are the stepping stones to improving your game and making it more efficient and pretty much getting to done however I will say that there's more to it than that, but that's probably one of the most biggest and most common mistakes that I've seen in Q players' games are those, uh, or those two things, efficiency and lack of counting. Uh, if you are 5Q, I think that's when I start teaching it, uh, when I start encouraging you to do it. So five, you can get to 5Q without uh, counting every single turn, and I'm not talking about counting as in counting the board every single turn. You don't have to count the board every single turn. You should count after every exchange, you should revalue with the board. What I'm saying after 5Q or starting at 5Q, you should start practicing counting the future. In other words, uh, reading multiple variations and comparing the, uh, comparing the variations on how each variation affects the scale of points. Uh, so you say for 20Q and up, but I think you can get out of the 20Qs probably within a month if you're playing a lot, but the average is two months. If you're playing every week, like five to 10 games a week, two months you can get out of 20Qs easily. Uh, also, Zephyro, do you know about the classy approach? Does everyone know about the classy approach? Because I base all my lessons off of the classy approach. <laughs> Uh, www.shansgogroup.com Check out the classy approach on that website. That is like the how-to guide on playing a good move every single turn. What I the, This lecture is to expand on that and say how do we evaluate uh, if I played the good move or not in your reviews. And this is how to evaluate a board, how to evaluate an exchange, a sequence. So that, that is counting. That's how you judge if, a sequ if you, the sequence is correct or not. So the classy approach will tell you what you're supposed to be doing, ideally, but you need to still read, which is in the classy approach, and judge. The judgment step is also in the classy approach, but how do you judge? Well, you look at the exchange rates, and that's what, uh, uh, that's what uh, this whole lecture is about, is counting and improving your judgment and evaluating stuff. So hopefully this will help you review your games. So how does the classy approach compare to Haniel's basics? Uh, I'm not familiar with Haniel's basics. Let me check. Uh, I will read over it. And if this is, yeah, Haniel's basics. The classy approach is actually many professional players theories all compiled into a step-by-step -step guide. So there's lots of stuff in the classy approach. So probably this has similar stuff. Um, these are good strategy. Like this is a strategy. The your stones are garbage. That's a good idea. It's a strategy though. Try to snooky as much as possible. Sente is valuable. Yes. Uh, try to connect your stones if possible, but don't fanatically cling to it. Uh, that one's situational. Don't let your opponent close stuff off. Yeah, that's that's true. Don't have anything to do. Jump to the center. That's the middle game. Uh, make frequent, simple, positional judgments. Try to... Yeah, 60 points. 60 points. Okay. 
60 points, guys. This is a very magical number. <laughs> 60 points. Uh, if you are counting in your game reviews or during your games, 60 points is a very magic number. And that is because, on average, most players get about 60 points by the end game. If you have 60 points by the end game, you're playing probably a very good game. Your opponent might also have 60 points. They might have less than 60 points. But likely, if you get to 60 points and start the end game, then you're usually pretty good. And after the end game, you usually finish with around 70 to uh, you can any from anywhere from 70 to 80 points. That is a very average and very common number. So if you have 60 points on the board and you're starting end game, then probably you're okay. This is not always the case. It's just a lot of the time. Like there are cases when both sides have more than 100 points. It's very rare, but it happens. But 60 points is a very good magic number uh, to remember. Uh, big C-shaped center. That's the bowl shape he's talking about. Uh, yeah, these are all good strategies. Don't try too hard to make points in the center. Yes, center and gote. Don't make center and gote. Uh, check out for forcing moves. Sente for exchanges, attack and defense. Try to connect to prevent opponent's tanuki if it makes sense. Don't understand that one. Yeah, I don't understand that. This is the only one I don't understand. But all the other stuff makes sense. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of basic strategies in that. That's good. Uh, I I like mine, but <laughs> I like the classy approach, but I wrote it, so I'm really biased. Uh, all right, so Haley's Rose Method. Haley's Rose Method. I would say Haniel has a lot of... Those are a lot of good strategies, but you need to also need to extend, uh, understand them. Every strategy that you see or every lecture that you uh, watch all of that is really good stuff but if if you don't understand it too much uh, or if you own if you don't understand it perfectly and you're playing in the wrong time even the best strategy can be a bad move if you're playing at the very wrong time it's like playing Joseki's in the wrong direction Joseki's are good strategies are good common theorems are good but if you're playing it in the wrong direction or the wrong situation or completely wrong space in general, then of course it's going to be bad. Okay, response. Do I need to respond? Yes, this is something you ask every single turn. Yes, that's very important. Do I need to respond? Every single turn you should be thinking about Tanuki. Uh, what are my options? Yes, every single turn you should have more than one option. Um, can I take any of them as Sente? Oh my gosh, yes, yes, definitely. Sente is important. This is attack and defense. This is what I stress in attack and defense, and this is why I say weakness first. Uh, it's similar to this. Uh, for example, if I play the next big move, my opponent plays the next big move, it's going to be about even, right? But if I can do something in Sente and then get to the next big move, that means I just made a profitable exchange in Sente and then get to the next big move. But don't do something stupid in Sente. For example, don't make something that does not have any value in Sente. It just doesn't make any sense. The whole point of Sente is uh, doing something in Sente is to make a profitable exchange that is in your favor, even if it's only one point, even if it's just one point Sente, or one point in your favor in Sente, it's still really good. You made one point in Sente and still get to the next big move. That is one point more valuable than just playing that big move. So yes, can you take any of them in Sente? Uh, expected results, that is read and then judge, compare and choose basically. So, for example, you give yourself options, you read it out, and then you judge which one gives you which one is the most profitable in the exchange of points. So, yes, this method is very, very good. I highly recommend the Rose method. Uh, so, yeah, this, um, yeah, you guys have the link in the chat. Uh, but yes, this is a very good method. Uh, I'll actually put this on the classy approach. I will do that. Uh, and then I'll cite this page. So I'll leave this page up. I'm going to move it over. So we will add the rose method to the classy approach. We can do that. And then I'll cite that link. Uh, sente is forcing. That's what sente means. Sente is forcing. So yes, the rose method, very, very good. But at the same time, you also need to understand what you're doing. For example, 
Is this Sente good? Not really, because you're just getting a weak group. But this Sente, and then big move, may very well be good, because you just reduced like five points for free, and then got to the next big move. So yeah, um, everything is about how well you understand it, and how well you can apply it. So I would say the Rose method is also very similar to the Classy approach, just in different wording. Um, I still am biased to the Classy approach just because I kind of made it in a step-by-step -step course instead of just... Rose is also step-by-step. -step. I just kind of elaborated a lot, a lot more. But I would say everyone has different theorems. So uh, Hanio has his strategies. Haley has her strategies. Cla me, I have my strategy. I have the Classy approach. You have all this information. Try to find the ones that are similar. Try to find all the steps that are similar and those are the ones that probably everyone knows and they just have different understanding of it and then create your own understanding like how well do you understand these concepts if a concept gets repeated in multiple people's theories or multiple people's step-by-step -step guides or in go books if those theories or steps get repeated those are likely very important steps to remember uh so i would definitely remember those and also try to apply it and then try to have someone else look at it to see if you're applying it correctly and constantly improve your understanding of it. So don't just look at it once. Uh, I've had many of my students look at the classy approach, they look at it for a month and then another three months will go by and they start forgetting steps in the classy approach because they haven't looked at it in three months. And I'm like, well, how do you, we're supposed to build off of the classy approach, but if you're not looking at the classy approach like all the time or every other week, then how are you building off of it? Uh, how are you developing your understanding of it? Uh, how are you improving it if you're not looking at it all the time? So if you're not thinking about the classy approach or the rose approach or whatever approach, if you're not thinking about it, re-coming back to it, revisiting it, rereading it many months in it, over and over and over, like for like a year at least, uh, then how are you expanding your understanding of it? How are you improving your understanding of it? Uh, so I, I could argue that all of these are good, but you need to look at these like at least once or twice a month at minimum for like a year uh, and constantly improve on these methods because these methods are good at every level. At every level, these methods are good. So at every level, you can improve your understanding of these methods. And these methods are still the same thing. The wording can be exactly the same, but how you apply it will become more and more effective the stronger you get, but you need to still remember what it is. So keep revisiting the methods. Uh, and I think that's that's also something else you can do to improve because we all have methods, Haniel, Rose, Classy Approach. Uh, there's all kinds of methods, but if you don't keep practicing it for a long time, you'll never master any of them. So yeah, uh, I think the Rose Approach is very good, but uh, the whole point, the, the theme of this lecture was counting the, counting the board and looking at the exchange rate of points and then figuring out after each variation, how did it, how did each of the variations affect the exchange rates? Uh, and then we also looked at the efficiency. And these are two things I think if you focus on when you review your games, review your games, uh, if you review your games um, and you focus on these two things, I think it'll really help you, your understanding of what you're doing wrong. And then it'll also help you improve your game when you review and make your reviewing your own games much more effective and much more efficient when you do it. So hopefully this lecture made sense, but uh, just in case it didn't, uh, now would be the time to ask any questions about this lecture. Does anyone have any questions about this topic, this lecture, or anything else in general that you would like me to elaborate on or maybe clarify or maybe expand on? Um, so that way you can understand it better. Uh, and there, was there anything you didn't understand in this lecture? Because it's a very high level con idea, but it's also very important. So any questions that you guys have?
right? Doesn't look like there's any questions. But all right, so makes sense, but I'm gonna focus on more basic stuff first. Okay, classy approach. Classy approach is basics. I am I did write it, but I'm very confident in the classy approach and very confident the classy approach will help your game. Uh, all right, so that's it for this lecture. So uh, I'm done with the lecture, but does anyone want a game review? Because I'm teaching today. Uh, does anyone want a game review or a teaching game? Does anyone want to play and practice? Uh, does anyone want a teaching game? Does anyone want their games reviewed? Uh, I'll give it a go. Cool. Um, and uh, also, shout out for my website, my private lessons. I am seeking students because I am now teaching much more often and I'm trying to convert everything uh, to get more students. So if any of you guys would like lessons, please check it out at seansgogroup.com and click on the lessons tab.